Welcome to Maximizing Your Potential with pastor and teacher Timothy Miller of White Dove Church. White Dove Church is located in the heart of Lafayette at 1400 West University Avenue with weekly service times every Sunday morning at 8 and 10.30 a.m. and a midweek service on Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. Now let's join Pastor Timothy for another life-transforming word from God. I'm putting a little bit of a segue into something different. And uh, I want to talk about success. And so the first message in, in this new kind of direction is extraordinary success. Everybody say extraordinary success. I think we can relate with when I say, hey, you know, I want extra mayonnaise. Extra pickles, you know. Can I have extra cheese, right? So what is that? That's, you know, I don't want just what is offered. I want more than what's offered. Because I want to be extra blessed. I enjoy pepperoni, but I really want extra pepperoni. Right? And so if we can take that mentality today, it's going to help you to be able to receive this message because most Christians, as I've told you before, the last time we made a spirit-led decision was when we got saved. Because we live for God through our emotions, through our feelings. We come to church if we feel like it. We come to church, you know, we, 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 we give if we feel like it. We, 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 we worship if we feel like it. We nice if we feel like it. Don't get quiet on me now. And so what we got to deal with today is the fact that, you know, extraordinary success is a spirit-led mindset. To come out of the norm and to come out of, I'm just getting by, okay? And so I want to look at some verses of scripture that's going to help us to get us in the right direction as we look at this today. In Joshua chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse 6, and it says, Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which my servant Moses commanded you. And do not turn from the, from the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This is a beautiful picture to show us the importance of focus. Somebody say focus. You got to keep your eyes on what's in front of you, right? And then we go, of course, to the scripture we all know in verse 8 this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth but you shall meditate everybody say meditate we are what we read and what we internalize and what we rehearse and what we rehearse again and so we have to meditate by the renewing amen we have to have this thing renewed so you got to meditate in a day and night that you might observe to do according to all that is written in it for then everybody say then for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Not just success, but good success. All right? And I want to look at one more portion of scripture before we pray in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that I just alluded to a moment ago. And do not be conformed to this world, which is what? Don't be like the arrangement of the culture that is around you. Don't become like when I was growing up, the MTV generation. Oh my God. If you saw some of them people that were on the MTV, do you really want to be lumped in with them? Come on, somebody. Don't be like the culture. Don't be like the iPhone generation. Don't be like the people that are staring at, at Max and sitting and they're controlled by social media, but rather, be transformed rather than be like the Facebook nuts and renew your mind so that you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life. So we're talking about extraordinary success today that can only be found 
in the Word of God. Let's go to God and ask Him to be with us as we delve into this today. We're going to lay some foundation and I'm going to try to go to work quick. But I want you to hear with your spirit today. Amen. Father, we thank you for the Word. We thank you, God, that it is alive, that it's powerful, that it is breathing, and that as we digest it today, it will not only challenge us, move us, shake us, but God, my prayer is that it would shape us, that we would be different, that we would walk out of this place different than when we walked in it because of revelation received. Now, we thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name, and all the church said, amen, amen and amen. So, we're talking about this thing of extraordinary uh, success, and I alluded to it a little while ago when I said, you know, extra pickles, you know, extra bacon, because we do live in a society that basically in this society, if you want something that would feed you, well, if it feeds the flesh, give me more, give me more, give me more. But then when it comes to the spirit, we, we're, we're okay with lack. Amen. Right. When it comes to the things of, the, of God and how we walk with the Lord, we're okay with just enough. We're okay with just a, a am I in the right place today? Yeah. Just a good enough church service. So I can just get it out of the way so I can go on with my, with my day. Are y'all here? See, I'm not, I'm not okay with a good enough church service. I want to worship him because he's king. Yeah. And so I want an extraordinary opportunity to be in his presence. And so because so many of us are conditioned from birth to think a certain way, we understand that, of course, we are born, and then we are born into a family that then, because of that family we've been born into, we begin to think in a certain direction, and that thought life is what helps us to navigate everything, every decision, every relationship we walk in. See, retraining your brain to think uh, in agreement with God's word takes true discipline where you have to be able to actually lean into it. You have to work at it. You have to be able to really, really work hard because the first thought comes natural. And so to rein in that first thought and say, wait a minute, I need a spirit thought takes discipline. Now, if we're going to walk in extraordinary success, we have to be able to rein in those first thoughts that we have become accustomed to because of what mom and daddy taught us or because of what we learned at school or because of what we saw on television or read in some book. And we have to rein that in and say, what's the Holy Spirit speaking? See, everyone goes through life with either a worldly mentality or a kingdom mentality. There is no third choice. So I believe today, as we lay the foundation of this, it's important that we choose to develop a renewed mind as laid out in the scripture reading we just read together, chapter uh, uh, 12, verse 2 of Romans, that look, you got to renew your mind in order to achieve extraordinary success. Because the mind you have outside of Christ can only get you in the natural realm so far. That's right, yeah. The mind you have without Jesus can only get, you can be as successful as you want to be according to the standards of the world. Yeah. Yeah. But you can never achieve all that God has for you until you come out of that mindset and take on the mind of Christ. That's right. See, Psalm 19 verse 14 says, let the words of my mouth, and watch me now, the meditation of my heart be acceptable. Why is that important? Because what are you thinking about? What are you, what are you constantly meditating on? And then what are you rehearsing, right? Well, you always, well, I got a bad report from the doctor. I got a bad report from the doctor. And every 10, you know, you keep seeing, I got a bad report from the doctor. And you see somebody else, I got a bad report from the doctor. Well, you know, hey, the first time I got a bad report from the doctor, but That's right. yeah, yeah. I choose to meditate that by his stripes 
I was healed. But see, we don't do that because of why? Because of the brain being trained to spew out negativity first. See, your brain is a programmable physical organ, and your mind has control over your thoughts by volition, by your personal will. Your spirit should dictate to your mind, which is your thought, emotions, and will, the thoughts that it should be thinking about. It's not about how you feel. It's not about how you feel. It's about what God's saying. It's not about how you feel. It's about how God, you know, it, Jesus was in the garden. If Jesus would have made a decision on how he felt, then he never would have went to the cross. Because he said, hey, Dad, you know what? I'd like this cup to go to somebody else. Yeah. I'm not thirsty. <laughs> and he could have left it right there and said, never mind. But he added the most important part to that conversation. But not my will, soul, Amen. emotions, feelings, but the spirit will rise. I'm going to the cross. It's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. I'm going to do it, though, because it's what you want me to do. Are y'all here? So when we talk about extraordinary success, we first have to understand that it's not about how we feel or what we want. It's about being spirit-led. It's about allowing the spirit to direct us. And then once we recognize that, we come to the word in Genesis 12 because we have to establish it's God's will for us to be successful anyway. So before we go any further, let's look again at what we've been looking at for the last many weeks in Genesis 12, 2 and 3. He says, now make it about you. Put your name right there. He says, I will bless you. Put your name right there and make you, your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Because he wrote it to you. That's right. We get messed up when we read the Bible and say, well, it's not about me because they were talking to Moses or they were talking to them or they were talking to that one. Look, it's God inspired to all of us. So he says, I'm going to bless you and make your name great and you're going to be a blessing and I'm going to bless those who bless you and I'm going to curse those who curse you. See, you and I must take the word of God personal to us and believe that God promised it to us and that he's still promising today to us to bless us with prosperity, which is whatever we need, when we need it, be it wisdom, be it money, uh, be it health, be it restored relationships, whatever it is, that's true prosperity, along with, watch this now, extraordinary success. You're going to have to retrain yourself today, and I'm going to keep on, keep on, keep on putting it on you that you're going to get out of the mindset of just success because God's called you to more. So when we go to Galatians, just rehearsing a little bit of where we've come from, Galatians 3, 13 and 14 says that Christ redeemed us, which is you and me, say you and me, from the curse of the law, having himself become a curse, for us, there we are again, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Amen. Deuteronomy 8.18 Remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you the power to create wealth in order to confirm his covenant which he swore to your ancestors which is still valid today. So we're just establishing both a timeline in the scripture as well as uh, the way that God established uh, his promise to us as a people that we could be blessed and have success. Daniel 1.10 shows us who we are in reference to the wicked world that's around us. In every matter of wisdom and understanding, the king declared that God's people are ten times better than anyone in the world system. Yes, amen. So I don't know about you, but I made a decision. I'm part of that number. Yeah, but my, my life needs to be elevated a little bit more than where it is right now so that I can be able to look like what that scripture says I am. So we must develop a commanded blessing consciousness 
as designated heirs of the promise of the Spirit, which means you need to act like you are who you are and that you can have what you can have and not feel like you have to ask permission for whatever belongs to you. When you get out of this church today and leave to go to your car, you're not going to ask anybody in here permission to get in your own car to go home. And if you do, we'll have a counseling department set up for you next week. No, because ownership understands. Look, that's my car. I'm going to get in it. I'm driving. I'm going home. Well, as an heir to the promise of the Spirit, you don't have to ask permission to have everything God has already given to you. See, everyone lives what they believe and sees the product of their belief manifested daily. So if you don't like what your life is producing, then change it. The amens are overwhelming me. Amen. See, the truth, the truth is hard. The truth is hard. Because, see, when I say, see, most people come to church and they want, you know, let's, let's get mad at the devil. Let's get mad at the people in the world. And let's talk about them for an hour. But now I'm talking about you. Let's see, I'm putting the responsibility back on you that if you don't like your life, then you got to change it. So say it again. Say extraordinary success. Now look, we can't preach a message like this and not read Ephesians 3.20. Because it says to us what? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, super abundantly, above all that we could ask, think, or imagine according to what? The power that resides in heaven? No. That works in you and me. We're not tapping into a source somewhere off somewhere in outer space. It lives on the inside of us. And so when you speak a matter, you need to understand there's a power behind your words that when you speak in faith, that when you ask something in faith, that when you think upon something in faith, when you imagine something, when you dare to dream a dream, that the power that works and resides inside of you is what's going to make it come to fruition. See, everybody has an opinion of what success means personally, and each person's personal definition should not be judged. We shouldn't sit in here and tell somebody, well, you know, you, you need to change your approach towards success. No, the truth actually is this. Only you can judge your success in fulfilling your God-given potential. And what I mean by that is nobody in here can tell me because I'm, look, I'm my toughest critic. I could easily say, hey, I got a home, I got a vehicle, I got a nice church, everything's paid for, got wonderful people to pastor, I'm just going to die here in Lafayette. I'm just going to grow old, love my grandchildren, I'm going to die, I'm going to die somewhere here, it's going to be a wonderful life. But let me tell you something that might shock you. We could fill this building up twice and I still would not fulfill my God-given potential. We could fill this building up three times on a Sunday and I still would not fulfill my God-given potential. We could fill this building up four times on a Sunday and I still would not fulfill my God-given potential. You say, Pastor, man, that's a lot of services. Let me tell you something. God has spoken to me what my potential should be. So I know where I'm headed. And so I'm the only one that can judge how far I am from where I need to be. Now the problem with this is, is I'm going to be honest about my situation. But too many people in the church are settling. Because we're going to heaven, the devil's not going to get us, and you know, the Antichrist's not going to get us, you know, the 666's not going to get us, you know, we're not going to have to get our head chopped off, we're okay, we're going to heaven. But the problem is that's not success. That's salvation. That's right. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. 
see, success is usually defined as the degree of attaining some desired outcome or object. The problem is success is not something you can put in your hand. Success is actually the accumulation of events turning out a desired outcome, which is speaking to what? Not product, but producing. In other words, it's not what you get in the end, it's how you got there. It's action, it's movement. And so we deal with the problem that success many times has been diluted and devalued from the original meeting. So I'm going to shout to you and sound the alarm to you that don't get stuck in the relief level of success. Yeah. Amen. I'm just looking for some, some relief. I'm just looking to just, because the minute something good happens, then you feel like, okay, success. I can breathe. The problem is, then you get stuck and you don't go any further. See, I don't believe that anybody should consider themselves successful if they're living in a relief level. Poverty, not enough. Nothing. Okay? Then you come into the relief level, just enough. I can pay the bills. I can make it. I'm going to get there. I think I can. I think I can. Oh, I just barely made it, but I made it. More than enough. I'm blessed. I'm doing good, and I can bless somebody else. And the problem is, if we're not willing to come to this level, someone else is not going to receive from the Lord the blessing for their life that he wanted to use you as the conduit to be. Are y'all tracking? See, extraordinary success is defined under the category of superabundantly, not just enough. So we have to know who we are. And I love this passage of scripture because it tells me who I am. It tells me where I came from. It tells me where I'm going. In 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. His own special people that you might proclaim. Well, how, how come I've been chosen? How come I've become, become a royal priesthood? Why am I now a other than nation, a, a holy people, set apart people? Why am, I, why, am his, why am I his own special people? So that I would proclaim the praises of him that called me out of my worst yesterday and brought me into my greatest today and my most awesomest tomorrow. That I no longer have to live in who that guy was yesterday because, whoo, man, that guy was something else. I got to leave him over there in the rearview mirror because I want to be who I am becoming. Then I look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. God has raised us up together and seated us to sit together in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And then the last verse right here to make this point, 1 John 4, 17. As he is, so are we now in this world. What did he say? I'm leaving, but I'm giving you some authority. You're going to take the baton and you're going to have the same power that I had. You have the same authority that I had. So now we're just like he was. So as he is, we now are in this world. We are joint heirs. We're not little gods. But we are just like him. Are y'all all right? And so when we understand that, then we have to understand the word succession. Because in the Middle Age period, Success meant a person succeeding to the throne. The king was on the throne, then he dies, and then his heir is now succeeding in the same authority in that position. He is now king, or if it was a her, she is now queen, and they are now succeeding in the same authority and the same power. It's just as if that king was still talking, but it's a different person. Y'all see that? See, in the spirit, we've been given the power to be seated together with the king of all kings, 
given the same power, given the same authority. So now when we speak, it's the same as if Jesus was still here speaking. Because we are in the succession. Y'all see that? So as members of Christ's body, success is our purpose. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So we have been given kingdom authority, which is manifested through extraordinary success. So say with me, say, hey, extraordinary success is mine today. And so when we go to Mark 8, 37, it says, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? I mean, when you really think about it, what is it in this life of any value that we want to put our hands on? Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly as to the Lord and not to men. Amen. So we're not working for something from somebody else just like us. See, success must be valued as an ethical obligation and a responsibility. It shouldn't be a box on the application that we decide to check yes or no. It should be always understood it's a part of who we are. You see, accepting extraordinary success uh, as an option is the major reason so few actually created. See, as disciples, we must become accountable to God for all available to us, leaving nothing on the table, because the last thing you want to do is get to heaven and find out from the Father of all that you could have done. Look, I preach about maximizing your potential. I preach this message for years. I don't want to go to heaven and God tell me, man, you were close, but you didn't maximize your potential at all. I'm the one that don't want to hear that because I'm always telling everybody else they need to. So I don't want to leave nothing. That's why I'm like, okay, I need to make sure that I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing to do what God has called me to do. See, almost everyone lives their lives without ever coming close to their potential. That's tough. We don't even come close. See, anyone that doesn't embrace great success as a kingdom responsibility simply won't even try to succeed on any other level. So if I'm not interested in great success, if I'm not interested in any type of success, well, then I'm not going to be successful at all in any area. Because I'm just not interested. That's right. That's right. I'm just settling. I'm just getting by. I'm just happy to have some relief. I'm just happy to be able to pay my bills. I'm just happy I don't get no creditors calling me. I'm just happy to be left alone in my house because I don't want no trouble. See, success is absolutely critical to your future generations. The question is, how will your children benefit if you quit on your potential? Well, you know, it's just me. I'm the only one who lives in my house. Yeah, but what about your kids? They grew up, well, you know, they're old enough. They need to see about themselves. Well, yeah, but the Bible says you're supposed to. Yeah, there's that scripture that kind of tells us we're supposed to leave something. Amen. See, Joshua 1, 7 says, only be strong and very courageous. You know what the biggest problem we have in the church, other than the fact that we think we know everything? It's called fear. And so you got to know that we must decide to dominate the spirit of fear, and we must become dangerous instead of always avoiding danger. What do you say when you, you know, your kids leave the house? Hey, have fun and be safe. Make sure you be safe out there. It's a, it's a rough world out there. And nobody, nobody is, is cares about you. Be, be safe. Look out for number one. Right? 
since childhood, everybody has tried to keep you from danger by instilling fear in your, in your life. Uh, be careful when you walk across the street. Uh, you know, look both ways. Be careful. You know, don't make eye contact with a stranger if you're in a big city. You know, you know watch it now. You know, there's, there's, there's evil afoot, right? Well, look, most people are so intent upon avoiding danger that they avoid successful living. So what if we just flip the script? When we leave our homes, our natural declaration should be be safe, but our spirit declaration should be go be dangerous. Because <laughs> no risk, no reward. So, hey, they're walking out the door. Hey, listen, you're going to be dangerous today for Jesus now. <laughs> Make sure that you cause as much trouble as you can while you're out there today. For the kingdom of God. Are y'all here? Because look, this is our mantra. This is, this is what we should be speaking uh, as, as the people of God. In 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. But he has given us empowerment. He's given us love. He's given us sound mind, clear thinking. So we shouldn't be playing it safe as a believer. Look, don't play in the street during rush hour traffic, but get out there and fight some devils. Are y'all here? See, you, you can, through a conscious effort, you can actually make a decision to meditate on God's word, and through that, you can program your mind to accomplish whatever you desire. It's absolutely possible. If you make a decision, that's really what you want to do. Look, we know because of what took place in Genesis 11.6 that the Lord said, look, they are one people with the same language for all of them. And this is the only the beginning of what they're going to do. Look, nothing that they have a mind to do will be impossible for them because they made a decision. We have to make a decision. How do we know this? Look, it's important to understand that a belief can become a physical manifestation. I remember growing up, I love boxing. I love boxing. I love it, I love it, I love it. There's nothing like watching two grown men sweaty trying to kill each other. It's just a joke. But I like to watch the boxing, and the reason I like to watch it is because there's so much personality with it. When I was growing up, I remember we used to talk about, of course, in my house, we were talking about, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard and, uh, and, and uh, George Foreman and, and, of course, Muhammad Ali. And, you know, and then years passed on, Mike Tyson, you know, that ear-eating boxer, right? And Holyfield, right? Well, look, but the thing about Muhammad Ali that comes above all of them, is that he never believed he was ever going to lose a fight. He would psych him out. Oh, I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. And he did that whole song and dance. And everybody, the referee, the other boxer, everybody believed he was going to win before the bell ever hit the first round because he spoke with such a passion. And that belief manifested into the physical manifestation because he walked out what he believed on the inside. It's a known fact in sports, if you can get in the other team's head, they've already lost. And so if we can take that uh, extraordinary success mindset and, and, and do what with it? Make it a determination from our insides that we decide that we're going to have our focus we're going to focus on our vision. We're going to direct uh, everything we have towards our vision. And we're, and we're going to put all of our energies into our vision. We're going to see our vision come to pass. Yeah. Yeah. Now look, I like to say, look, the extraordinary, or like I, I like to say, extraordinary. Because yeah. remember, extra pickles, right? The extraordinary success requires extraordinary belief with extraordinary action. All right? So we're adding to it. It's not just a little bit. We're adding to it 
so that we can persistently be in opposition to that extraordinary resistance because the devil's putting everybody on the case, adding extra devils, extra, extra fight against you, ever extra sickness, an extra attack on your finances and on your relationship. Why? Because he wants to stop you from that success that you're trying to achieve. So the process is, if I want that success, I gotta beef up my belief. I gotta beef up my action so that I can fight against that beefed-up resistance. So extraordinary success demands taking risks in massive actions that average ordinary people would never do. Because average ordinary people are just glad they don't have no trouble. See, John 14, 13 says, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So what does that tell us? Success is an obligation to glorify God in the life that he purchased. So the Father's like, hey, I'm going to bring success in your life if you cry out to me. Anything you ask, think, imagine, I'm going to bring it because I want to get some glory out of this situation. The problem is, we don't believe it, so we don't ask for it, we don't think about it, we don't dream for it, we just settle. See, success is a lifestyle decision that must be maintained while stretching to a higher level. So I'm always looking for what's next. There's no limitation, okay? Whatever God wants to do to you, he's going to do it through you, but you have to be the conduit that receives it so that that extraordinary, extra, extra, read all about it, God's getting glory because you allowed it to come in you. And so what do we do is we no longer are just a Sunday morning Christian just happy that we're not burning in hell. Like, look, you, you're laughing, but the people in the world, that's, that's what they think we're about. Because the first thing that they say when you talk to them is, so you think because of the way I live, I'm going to go to hell, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they want to know. Yeah. Well, no, what I really want to talk to you about is how you can live a wonderful life in Christ. If you want to go to hell, that's up to you. I'm trying to offer you abundant life. Yeah. Are y'all here? See, success is available to everyone regardless of gender, race, culture, or current circumstances. Success must become vital to the future well-being of an individual, a family unit, or future generations to come. It should be a thing in your mind. Look, when our grandkids come to the house and I see them playing and I see them running around and I hear, I hear them call, you know, and talk to us and whatever, I'm thinking to myself, now, what are you going to be doing? What are you going to have your hands to 20 years from now? What, what, I, I need to constantly be trying to, to think of how I can help to bring success in their life so that I can speak success in their life, help them whatever way I can, because I want them to be the best they can be. I want them to be around an environment of success. I want it to be normal for them to grow up and see not only their parents uh, doing well, but their grandparents doing well, and everyone around them doing well. Why? Because we're pushing towards something higher. Success provides kingdom witness, security, confidence, enthusiasm, and vision for expansion. Look at that word right there, expansion. So again, we're not just happy with what we have. We're happy that we have it because it's a step of where we're going. We're glad we have it, but it's only what we have until we get to our next level. See, anybody that minimizes the vital importance of continued success doesn't realize the giving up of potential accomplishment. Why would you want to give up or leave anything on the table? 
Most people get stuck in the memory of the moment that has already passed at the expense of living in their present moment. So the moment comes, and it was a wonderful moment, and so now I'm living in that moment, and I'm remembering that moment. That's why people don't have revival, because all they can do is talk about how revival happened back in 1982. Man, God moved. It was so wonderful. Well, what has he done for you lately? We thank God for what he did, but we believe in God for something now. I built my life upon awakening upon awakening. I want revival now. I've been a part of revivals, but I want revival today. I thank God for what he did, but I'm not living in that because yesterday's success can't be where it ends. So I can't live in the memory of what took place in the past moment at the expense of my present moment opportunity for success in Christ now. See, quitting on potential puts present and future family members at risk. I give up. It's just me. No. Because look, watch what happens if I give up. If I give up, everybody in my family pays the price. Then all my leaders in this church pay the price because I'm no longer moving forward, so I'm not growing. So that means if they're listening to me, they're not growing. Then if they're not growing, everybody connected to them is not growing. So everybody's potential has been frozen because of one person's decision to be selfish and not move any further than where he is right now. Now that's just my life. If you take your life and whoever you are, wherever you, whatever you're doing, whatever job you work, whatever you do, if you make a decision, I'm finished. I'm not going to maximize my potential. I'm going to level off right here. Everybody connected to you that could be established in the commanded blessing, that could have favor in their life, that could go to another level. They're not going any further because you leveled off and quit. Yeah, that's right. yeah. And so I have to continually push. Because I, some, some, I got some folks around here nipping at my heels all the time yeah. for another word, for another word. So I got to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep on moving higher so this thing can keep on moving higher. Right. See, your success will expose the excuses others have made for their giving up on their potential. Yeah. When you start to get successful, people start saying, hey, hey, slow down. What you doing? Where's the fire? Relax. Get a cup of coffee. What's going on? Hold on, hold on. Because why? Because misery loves company. And failure loves company. And so mediocrity has people over for dinner. Are y'all here? And so what happens is you start trying to move and then your circle of friends starts getting smaller because they can't hang around with you no more because you're just too successful. Yeah. You're just trying to be something all the time. And, you know, I thought we were just enjoying life and just relaxing. And, you know, we were, look, hey, we were just some average folk. And you, you're trying to be above average. That's just too much for me to handle. Amen? Yeah. So we come back to the fact of Ephesians 3.20 and the fact that it teaches us now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly or super abundantly. Super abundantly. You have to begin to make a decision that everything you do is going to be exceedingly abundantly. It's going to be super abundantly. That you're going to approach every decision with it's super abundantly. Not average, not normal, super abundantly. And so when you know that, then you know that there is no shortage, absolutely no shortage or limit of success in God's kingdom when you live according to Ephesians 3.20. Look, success is not a product, it's not a commodity, it's not anything that has limited resources. Success is not a game or a sport that allows for winners and losers. It's wonderful if you like football. I love football. I love football. But guess what? When you lift up that trophy at the Super Bowl, then you go home. It's over. You got to start over. 
everybody's trying to get you now. Yeah. And so it only lasts for a little while. But success in the kingdom lasts for eternity. Amen. See, success is not about competition. It is about completion of your potential. Yes. It's not about who gets there first. It's about who gets there and has done all that God has told them to do. Amen. It's not about competing and comparing. Well, you know, you have this, so I got to get that. And you have that, so why I don't have that. And, uh, and so, you know, we're looking at each other. And the problem is, you've not been called to the same race your brother or sister in Christ has been called to. So you can't compete and compare with anybody else in this room because God has spoken to all of us individually, given us all, each of us, according to the word of God, the grace to carry out our gifting, yes. not yours. Yes. I got the grace to, to carry out mine. You don't have the grace to carry out mine. You don't want mine if you're not called to do this. Right. You don't want it. You have to do what God's graced you to do right. and you have to complete it. See, there are no limits. Uh, there are no limits to options, opportunities, creativity, determination, desires, uh, and persistence. There's no limitations. Success cannot be acquired. True success can only be created by your desire and persistent action. So I don't get success because somebody gave it to me. I get success because I create it. I don't, I'm not an angry man because I choose not to be an angry man. I'm a happy person because I choose to be happy. The Bible tells me the joy of the Lord is my strength. I choose joy because I know that's where my strength's coming from. So I create an atmosphere in my life each day to walk in joy. It's a struggle. It's a battle. The devil don't want me to be happy, but I got to push through. In the same way, I create every opportunity by making a decision to seek it out. It ain't coming to me for free. I'm not going to just get it handed to me. I got to go out there and work for it and earn every opportunity to walk in success. Success evades whiners, crybabies, blamers, and all other self imposed uh, victims. We must, this morning, assume control and responsibility for our own success or the lack of our success. Yeah. It's nobody else's fault. Right. It don't have nothing to do with your mama, your daddy, or your whole generation. Come on, somebody. Right. You have to assume responsibility for wherever you are. Right. Successful people adopt an extraordinary belief. That whatever happens in my life, good, bad, or indifferent, or ugly, or nothing, I had something to do with it. Yeah. You have to take responsibility for that. You have to take responsibility for wherever you are and wherever you're headed and realize you now have the reins. Are y'all here? Yeah. We must assume control over everything that happens or we will be controlled by everything. We must assume control over everything that happens in life or we will be controlled by everything that happens in life. Right, yeah. So you have to make a decision. Because if you don't make a decision, then somebody else is going to make a decision for you. Right. Right. Yeah. And I've just come to the place in my life, I've lived long enough now that it, whether I win, lose, fail, draw, whatever it might be, I want it to be upon the decisions I've made, not somebody else's. First John 4, 4 says that you are of God and have overcome because greater is he that is in you than all of the devils in the world. Success begins with a decision. It becomes a lifestyle that must be maintained while stretching into a higher level again and again. Now watch the, watch the progression. Success begins with a decision. I've decided I'm going to live a life of success. So then I make it a lifestyle. And then daily I work at maintaining that lifestyle by maintaining my thought process to keep it in the spirit. 
And then while I'm doing that, I'm continually stretching not to allow myself to become comfortable and, and to pitch a tent uh, and, to, and to just decide I'm not going to stay there forever, but rather I'm going to move uh, with the cloud and know that God is taking me to new levels all the time. So I thank God for where I'm at, but I'm always looking for where I'm going. Philippians 3.13 says, Brethren, I don't think that I have arrived or I have all the answers. But there's one thing that I have together that none of y'all have together. I don't live in yesterday. See, if Paul was writing the Bible today, he'd have said, hey, listen to me, church. I don't have all the answers, but at least one thing's for sure. I'm not living in yesterday, and I'm pressing forward into what Jesus has for me. So I think you all ought to get on with the program and think about what God has for you today and tomorrow and start talking about yesterday. If Paul would have lived in yesterday, all we would have got was epistles about murdering Christians. I, Paul, a servant of Jesus, have this one reminder to you. I killed a lot of y'all. The end. What else can he talk about? I was the chief of sinners. I killed all of y'all. Please forgive me. God bless you. See, look, you and I have been designed by God to discern our thoughts and to focus forward. We can't live in yesterday. The old man's gone. That old person we were is gone. Leave that person on the cross. That person's been crucified with Christ and no longer lives. Christ now lives. And it's through him that I can be able to achieve the fullness of all that God has for me. So look, your attitude becomes your physical reality affecting perception. So as you think, that's what you become. Yeah, that's right. yeah. So if you continually think, I'm a failure, well, keep on prophesying. Right. And live in the fruit of your, your lips as a failure in life. I know somebody personally, they've always said this. Well, I live life like a cartoon character that has the, the cloud over my life where I'm walking around and it's only raining on me, and they think it's funny. The problem is, that's how they live their life. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing ever goes right for them. Everything wrong that could ever possibly happen, happens to them. Yeah. And they keep on prophesying. Yeah. yeah, everything bad happens to me. I just, I can't ever get a break, and they never do. Because you just begin to develop that attitude and you live your life with a chip on your shoulder and you're waiting for somebody to knock that chip off. I dare you. I dare you. The little battery commercials, they put the battery right there. I dare you to knock it off. I don't know, some of y'all don't know what that is. Go on YouTube. But anyway, the point is, the last word today is that we have to take this extraordinary, extraordinary success and we have to know that it is not a place. It is not a destination. It is not because of a certain thing or, or, a, or a home or a car or, or a city. It is a decision. So you have to take that decision and you have to decide today to begin to ask, think, imagine for the extraordinary, the extraordinary, the, the unbelievable. And according to the power within you, it's going to happen. But you have to move out into it. Now, we're going to work on this. We're going to work on this some more next week. But I'm going to tell you right now, you got to begin to practice this week. Because practice does not make perfect. Because if you practice how to not catch a ball, you ain't never going to be able to catch that ball. Practice makes permanent. So we need to take this week and we need to begin to practice how we speak, how we address uh, our situations, how we look at our life, 
And we begin to declare, we need to begin to take Ephesians 3.20 and we need to begin to declare over our situations super abundantly, exceedingly abundantly, believing for more than we could ever ask or think or imagine because of the power that works inside of us. Right. Would you stand with me this morning? Church is a place. Church is where. Where we meet as a body of believers to worship collectively. To be closer to God for his kingdom. Believers come together in a corporate setting. You can come and not worry about people judging because we're all doing the same it's thing. It's a place where we learn that we will spend eternity in heaven. Where you can lean on somebody. We learn about the way Christ walked the earth. And the Lord shows up in, in a mighty way. We are your church. 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 Don't you think it's time to come be a part of your church? Timothy Miller, pastor of White Dove Church here in Lafayette. I pray that the broadcast has been a blessing to you today. We'd love to have you come and be with us in one of our live services here real soon. We meet every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. and every Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. We're located on the corner of Congress and University. It's 1400 West University Avenue. We love you. We hope to see you soon. If you come worship with us, I promise you, you'll be glad you did. God bless you. Are you ready? Let's go.